Coming up on DTNS, how tech may keep airlines from losing your bag. Parents of Alexa protest Amazon. And should you destroy your Echo Dot instead of sell it? This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, July 2nd, 2021 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. And joining the two coolest people on the internet, your boy, Big Chris Ashley. <laughs> Drawing the top tech stories from Cleveland, I'm Len Peralta. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chain. The only thing that makes us cool is that we have Chris Ashley on the show. <laughs> See, That's it's right. all... It's all a circle. Uh, we were just talking about the uh, origins of the Wizard of Oz, uh, among many other things on Good Day Internet. If you want that wider conversation, become a member at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. General Motors announced that it's the first investor in an Australian company called Controlled Thermal Resources, which plans to extract lithium from the Salton Sea geothermal field, which is near Los Angeles, with GM getting first rights on any lithium that gets extracted. The project is expected to begin lithium production in 2024 and would be used in GM's Ultium battery cells. Currently, the U.S. only has one lithium production site. Two days after DD, the operators of DD Shuxing, went public on the New York Stock Exchange, the Chinese government announced it's conducting a cybersecurity review of the ride-hailing giant, during which time new users will not be able to sign up for the service. In its IPO prospectus, DD did warn that it could not guarantee investors that the regulatory authorities will be satisfied with our self-inspection results, and the company will receive greater and continued attention and scrutiny from regulators. They're just the latest to get that kind of attention in China. After launching in beta back in October, Facebook's cloud gaming service, Facebook Gaming, has expanded support to 98% of the mainland United States and is opening up availability in Canada and Mexico. The service initially launched with five games. It now has over 25 mostly mobile titles, including Assassin's Creed Rebellion as part of a partnership with Ubisoft. Ah, CEO Arvind Krishna's big moves continue to have effects at IBM. IBM's second highest ranking executive, President Jim Whitehurst, is leaving the company two years after he joined because IBM acquired Red Hat. Uh, he came over from Red Hat. He was a Delta before that. Senior Vice President of Sales Bridget Van Krollingen also announced her retirement. She'll be replaced by Rob Thomas. Neither the hockey player nor the musician, different Rob Thomas. Whitehurst's departure is the biggest since Arvind Krishna took over as CEO of IBM in January 2020. OnePlus announced on Friday that the OnePlus 8 series and all newer flagship phones will get three major Android OS updates and four years of security updates. It's pretty close to what Samsung is already offering. The new support schedule is a result of merging OnePlus's Oxygen OS skin with Oppo's Color OS on the back end. Uh, the interfaces of the two skins will remain distinct. It's also helped by Qualcomm offering updates for flagship systems on a chip for three years and security updates for four. All right. Speaking of chips, let's talk about those chip battles, Chris. So this chip battle is getting interesting. DK, uh, that's uh, from Asia. Sources say Intel and Apple began testing chip designs using TSMC's three nanometer production technology. With commercial output expected in the second half of 2022, TSMC estimates its process will improve performance by 10 to 15 percent and reduce power consumption by 25 to 30 percent. Now, Apple will reportedly use the chips in iPads next year. Intel confirmed it is working with TSMC for products in the 2023 lineup. NVIDIA and AMD already use TSMC for five nanometer chips, but Intel wants to be the first to use three nanometers. Meanwhile, Qualcomm says it can make a chip that beats the Apple M1, partly because it has former Apple chip designers like former A-series chip lead Gerald Williams, who left the company in 2019 with two other executives to start Nvidia, which was acquired by Qualcomm, which is the more interesting chip battle, guys. Intel trying to leapfrog AMD by using TSMC designs or Qualcomm calling out Apple after grabbing their engineers? I don't know. I got, to, I got two different answers because the most significant is Intel finally saying, yep, we told you we were going to outsource. We told you we were going to use TSMC. Here we go. We're going to do three nanometer chips. They, they, can't, they, they just delayed their seven nanometer chips. We're going to use three nanometer chips. They keep saying that this is temporary until they can get their own development uh, back on track. But I think that's the more significant. But man, it's hard to pass up Qualcomm 
saying, not only did we steal your people, Apple, but we're going to beat you on the M1, especially because the M1, you know, whether you love or hate Apple, everyone agrees that is a heck of a chip. That's a tall order. Interesting. What do you think? I don't I mean, as someone who's got an M1 chip in, in my newest MacBook Air, I'm like, Let's see it, Qualcomm. I mean, I don't really care. You know, let's let's make better chips, everybody. Let's do it. You know, For, first to the finish line wins. I have to agree with Tom. The EO, it is very interesting uh, when you get out of your comfort zone and you start doing things that are a little bit different because having fresh eyes, I can tell you from personal experience with uh, working in software, can change the whole game for for a product that you're developing because once you get you know, unfortunately you get these guys that have this deep knowledge and they know what they're doing but they just look at things one way because they've been doing it for so long and when you get another team involved you know things really awesome things can happen when when that happens but my goodness when you just start calling out the big dog on the block how can you ignore that it by any sense of the imagination definitely going to be an interesting chip war yeah, if, and if people don't know all the baggage around this, uh, uh, Qualcomm and Apple, of course, have sued each other a few times. Apple still uses Qualcomm parts for modems. Uh, Apple sued the people who left to start Nuvia because they claim they only left in order to take intelligence with them. And then Qualcomm snapped it up. Uh, a lot of people thought the idea with Nuvia was that Jared Gerard Williams uh, would start this new company and they'd get Apple to acquire it, uh, and Qualcomm acquired it itself. Uh, so there's there's a whole made-for-TV movie uh, going on behind the scenes there. Well, does I mean, do, doesn't that also kind of uh, you know make more lawsuits inevitable? If Apple was already like, hey, oh, yeah. hold on, this Nuvia thing doesn't seem right. Well, going after Qualcomm is you know that's that's a much bigger deal. Yeah, if Qualcomm makes a chip that's too much like the M1, Apple's going to bring the hammer down. You're absolutely right. Yeah. Uh, security researchers at Northeastern University purchased 86 used Echo Dot devices and found all previous passwords and tokens remained in the flash memory, sometimes even after a factory reset. Some of them hadn't been factory reset, which that's something you absolutely should do before you sell any tech product. Uh, but even when they had been factory reset, some of them still had info in there. All right, here's why. If you don't reset an Echo Dot, you can pretty much get all your data from it because it's still sitting there. But it also depends on how you reset it, how much information is left. Uh, they did need physical access to this, but if you're know, trolling around on eBay, you might find some stuff. You need to unscrew the bottom and read the memory, and then you can get the information out. So this isn't a remote hack. It's not even a particularly easy hack, uh, but it's one that it can be done. If you don't have it connected to Wi-Fi when you reset the Echo Dot and you forget to delete it from your Alexa app, they could recover the authentication token to log into your Amazon account and then be able to go in and control Amazon stuff. So that's a big one. You need to either be connected to Wi-Fi when you reset it or delete it from your app. Uh, you, you, if you don't do both of those, they're going to be able to get your token, at least the way it is now. If you do remember to do at least one of those things, either have it connected to Wi-Fi when you reset it or delete it from your Alexa app, they couldn't get that token, but they were still able to get your Wi-Fi SSID names passwords for those routers and MAC addresses of the connected router. Now, if their point was to try to get into your router, you know, use your Wi-Fi without your permission or get into your router, they could do that. Probably it's more about finding location uh, by, by using your MAC address and using your Wi-Fi SSID. In either case, the attacker would need to do some soldering to extract the data. So, this is, this is, again, not something that people are going to do on a whim. The researchers proposed a possible mitigation would be to encrypt the user data partition, which they said could be done in a firmware update and not degrade performance. Amazon, of course, responded by saying, we recommend factory reset and removal of the device from your account before disposing of it in any way. And Amazon is working on mitigation methods. If you're worried that someone wants to go to the trouble of cracking open an Echo Dot that you got rid of, and soldering it to find out where your router is and how to log into it or where you are, then your only option is to destroy the NAND chip inside at this point. But I don't think most of us have to worry about that. Chris, how does this make you feel, though? So there's a different perspective 
um, on this. And while you lay it out perfectly, right, you know, that's a lot of work just to recover uh, somebody's data that's stored on a on a device. But what it kind of exposes is that even to this day, with all that's going on and all the hacking that's going on, the manufacturers are still not thoroughly thinking about how to protect user data, right? Because yes, in this particular case, it's extremely challenging to get the information, but why are you not encrypting this data to, to begin with? And so, uh, and, and then the kind of the flippant response, like, oh, we, we would, you know, we, we recommend how you should delete. No, come on, guys. Just We, we got to start holding these manufacturers more accountable uh, for this stuff. Take user data seriously because breaches are every day now. Yeah, I'm with you on that, Chris. I, I, I understand that it's not always as easy as like erase button, you know, and then everything's fine, right? But uh, we spend so much time, when I say we, it's people who understand these things maybe more than other people, uh, that, you know, you, you, you have data that is, it is, is open, vulnerable, private, and you don't, you know, you, you don't take good enough care of it, and it's on devices, then you're gonna get in trouble. You know, it's a, it's a bad way to live. So if you've got a device where there is a method for doing the right thing, but it's a little bit more convoluted than that, then yeah, I think the, the it's it really is on the company to say if you're gonna take the initiative to to secure your privacy as much as possible, then something like this is it's asking too much of a lot of people, especially Echo Dot owners. Well, I I didn't take Amazon as being flippant. I took Amazon as reminding people like you do need to reset your your devices before you sell them. That's just good practice everywhere and saying this is the yeah. proper way to do it for us. Uh, I'm with you, Chris, that Amazon should have been encrypting that data from the beginning. Uh, too many companies take that shortcut. Uh, I'm glad that they are doing it now, it seems like. I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll get a, 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 a news story soon that it's done. Uh, and I overall see this as a good news story. It's yeah, somebody definitely. responsible found it and held Amazon's feet to the fire to fix it before somebody was able to use it for nefarious purposes. Yeah, I can't tell you how many times I've had to make a decision in the direction of a software, not because it was the easiest decision, but because I didn't want our users to end up shooting themselves in the foot. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. The BBC has a report about how airlines are updating data management in ways that make it less likely they will lose your luggage. In the past, data on you and your flight and your baggage was handled by email, PDFs, and some fairly rudimentary dashboard interfaces. Anybody who's tried to, I don't know, organize a simple party using those resources may wonder how any bag really even made it to its destination <laughs> using a method like this but hey that's how it was that's how it was going none of this information was accessible by the passenger either so you just kind of said buy a bag hope <laughs> you make it normally it did not always though you knew what happened with your bag when it showed up or didn't on the carousel didn't really know ahead of time New systems like SciSense, which is used by Air Canada, are app-based and work on desktops and tablets and watches, pushing information to employees and also passengers as they need it and as it progresses through its, you know, through its uh, through its own path. American Airlines was able to consolidate approximately 100 systems into 10. Another trend is decentralization. Centralized bag baggage handling system at airports have a centralized point of failure, so when it fails kind of a big deal, decentralized systems allow a lot more flexibility. These platforms are also working on algorithms that can anticipate problems before they happen. Yeah, I, I, I recently flew on Delta and was very pleased that my Delta app was telling me, hey, your bag just came off the plane. I'm like, oh, good, okay, uh, at least it got here. <laughs> it says it came off the plane where I am, that's good. Uh, mm -hmm. And then in one case, it even said, it's coming into this carousel, and the carousels still had a different uh, piece of information on them. And I was able to go to the right carousel and get my bag because the app was correct and the sign above the actual carousel had not been properly updated. So I, I, there's obviously some miscommunication going there, but but the apps the apps were working, at least for me, there. Yeah, this is very cool. Um, and I like it. I, I, you know, I travel both of these airlines, uh, Air Canada as well as American Airlines. So. Um, I don't check bags a lot anymore. I try to consolidate, but when I do, you know, there's always that anxiety of where's my bag? Is it going to be here? Um, so 
The only thing that they need to do for, at least from my experience, is they need to add your bag has been dragged across the tarmac uh, alert <laughs> and your clothes are strewn all over. And when you stuff them into the bag and yeah, your all your shoes and stuff are burned and melted together because of the heat of being dragged across the tarmac. Yeah, that is a true story. So yeah, some I, sensors. You you can't <laughs> oh, your bag is that's at a still high a little temperature. Smart. Man, I'm sorry to hear that's a true story too. Wow, <laughs> that's, that's a awful. true story. Yeah. yeah, I guess it's it's it is good to know. Listen, it's if I'm you know halfway you know uh, across the world and I'm making a couple connections and my bag is not going to be there when I land in London at 3 a.m. type of a thing, I would like to know. Hey, your bag is you know <laughs> headed to the North Pole a little <laughs> bit earlier through through a text message. Doesn't to, you know at that point it's kind of like when because I used United Airlines as my preferred uh, carrier. Um, carrier of, of me. Uh, but that uh, airline, as well as other airlines, have also gotten better at, at you get your text alerts well before the gate might tell you, oh, we've yeah. changed the gate or the flight yeah. is canceled or or delayed or whatever, whatever the update is, which is helpful. And it usually is happening, you know, on my mobile device first or, you know, my computer, if I happen to be on it. It's at it's at the point where you're like, oh, there's a problem. Now I got to call customer service. So it's still, you know, air travel and the baggage but it's claim, nice to know a little bit earlier the baggage claim perk definitely a huge plus because you all of us have been part of that stampede when you're all at like uh term uh, one and they're like oh no we switched it to 10 and everybody's like uh-huh. yo just let's go <laughs> yeah i mean uh to, to, to put a button on this this is actual digital transformation this is, this, you know what I mean? Like this yeah, is, uh, if you've heard that phrase kicked around, like this is it actually doing something, changing something, making things actually work better for people right there. Uh, well, we've been reminding you all week and we're gonna do it again. This Saturday, July 3rd, our science correspondent, Dr. Nikki Ackermans will kick off a limited series called Seniors in Tech, where she chats with seniors about the impact of technology on their lives. The first episode kicks off with Allison Sheridan, whose engineering career ended up being the gateway to technology and also podcasting. Check your DTNS feed this Saturday, July 3rd for more. The BBC reports that some parents who have children named Alexa are calling on Amazon to change its default wake word to a non-human name. One parent says other children only stop teasing and bullying the daughter, their daughter after they legally changed her name. They told the BBC, we have cut off friends and moved her to a new school to allow a fresh start. There was clearly not enough ethical research into using Alexa. Amazon responded in a statement, we designed our voice assistant to reflect qualities we value in people, being smart, considerate, empathetic, and inclusive. We're saddened by the experiences you shared and want to be very clear, bullying of any kind is unacceptable and we condemn it in the strongest possible terms. Alexa-enabled devices came to the UK in 2016, and the popularity of the name has dramatically fallen from the 167th <laughs> most popular name in England and Wales to the 920th popular name by 2019. That is quite a fall. <sighs> yeah. Quite a fall. Uh, I, when, I, I'm tempted to say uh, ch children can be awful, uh, but that's not a, as an excuse, right? That That's sort of like, this should have should have been expected. And I think that's what the parents are saying. You, you, you should have expected this. I'm not sure that any of us when Amazon launched the Echo thought of that. Uh, I'm not sure how much I hold Amazon culpable for that. On the other hand, it was a much smarter move for Apple to call it Siri, sure. uh, since there's not a lot of people named Siri. In fact, if you're named Siri, it's likely because you got named Siri after the, the voice assistant, uh, not before it. Uh, and, you know, okay, Google, Right, uh, yeah, whole, whole lot, whole lot Microsoft better. Use Cortana, Cortana, for the video game. yeah. yeah. Uh, so, so this this is not something where I I I would necessarily say we should have known ahead of time. Maybe we should, maybe we shouldn't. But certainly now, it's like you know what? Maybe don't name voice assistants after people for lots of reasons. This being sure. among them. Yeah, going forward, definitely let's not do that. But uh, you know, and I, yeah, I, I do feel bad because for the little girl because I, I hate bullies. I really can't stand them. Um, but uh, you know, the, that that's way out. You know, they're not changing the name. It's been a while since I don't know. I was a kid on a playground, but I, it, my first reaction is, but what are you getting teased about? I mean, 
it's it's it it's a name that represents a wealth of information reordering cool things you know you can you can do math you know ask alexa to do kind of everything but let's just say no it actually sucks to be a human with that name in this day and age totally get it uh, legally changing your kid's name seems like a dramatic way to solve this issue. Uh, again, I don't have a kid, uh, nor am I named Alexa, so I, I can imagine that it might get pretty bad at some point. There are other wake words, though. I use Sonos uh, to, to talk to my Amazon assistant, so I actually don't have the options to. I think it's Alexa Computer and Echo, uh, mm -hmm. right? That that you can you can change to. Not the default though. So, okay, I get that perhaps yeah, Amazon change, has some choices you there. You changing the default word is not going to stop kids at school exactly. from knowing about right. the name of I also just, you know, we're at some point, I don't know when, but at some point we're going to have more customization options for our wake words. So I think that's what the solution is here. I think that's you the know? ultimate solution is just let us all name it whatever we want. And right. then there's not this right. one iconic word. Because, sure, you, you can get made fun of for having the same name as somebody that was in a movie or a TV show or a book. Right. The thing is that fades away, whereas the echo doesn't. The echo stays in your house, and everybody keeps right. using it. You know, I told baby girl, I'll be like, listen, honey, it could have been worse. Your name could have been Joe Dierte. <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh man. Uh, see, that's Dan Ackerman has an article up called "Why Giant E-Ink Screens Like the Books Note Air." are my favorite underrated tech. He points out that most people think of the Kindle when they think of e-ink screens, but it's not the best example because it's very specialized and the screens are small at six or seven inches. The 10.3 inch screens of the Remarkable 2 and the Books are much more comfortable. He notes that e-ink screens are good for lag-free note-taking and drawing, and e-ink screens are easier on the eyes and good for long-term reading. The Books uses Android, which means you can even get the Kobo, Kindle, and Nook Android apps on that big 10.3-inch screen. Uh, Sarah, you've been testing the Remarkable 2 for the next Live With It special. What's your reaction to Dan's write-up? I agree. I agree. In fact, I've got it right here. I haven't talked about it too much because I'm still in my uh, review period, but... Yeah, I'm 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 with Dan on this. I also this is my first e-reader, and the Remarkable Two sort of specifically is very much considered a productivity tablet. I mean, it it's an e-device, but uh, but it <laughs> the process of reading e-books on the Remarkable Two is somewhat limited, and there's some workarounds you have to do because of DRM, EPUB. Anybody who's been through that, you know, it's it's possible, but it, there's some gray areas of legality, uh, but the just the e-ink itself and also the larger form factor I, I i have to assume makes a big difference especially if you're using it as a note taker i mean the remarkable has a, a pen and that's a big part of it you know it's it's signing documents and annotating things but also doodling and it, you know it's it's very much made for uh the sensation of you know holding a pen or a pencil in fact there's all sorts of different pens you can choose from calligraphy pen and stuff like that mm. uh, uh so 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 that part's neat and you want a bigger surface area i mean there's almost no situation where i wish it was much smaller unless i was trying to fit it into a very small specific bag let's say but but yeah i I think, um, and I was not familiar with the Books Note Air uh, until I in, until I looked through Dan's um, rundown of of some of the other options that the Remarkable Two gets put in the category of. Not cheap, um, and some folks say it is overpriced for what it does. But I, yeah, I think I think the larger form factor, something that resembles that eight by eleven piece of paper as closely as possible, is. For me, it, it makes the most sense, especially when I'm trying to go fully no paper in my household. I'm not there like yet, what, but I'm getting there. I like what Dan said about uh, people think of e-ink, they think of the Kindle, and it's it's not the best example of what e-ink can do. So uh, I, I, I like what you're saying is like, look, if you really want to take advantage of e-ink, you might want to look at a Remarkable 2 or a Books or something like that. Yeah, well, well, and I think I think a lot of people, especially like me, it's, it's not that I want to physical books, I, I'm fine with physical books, but it's not like I was like, e-readers suck. I like physical books. I'll never change. But I needed a little bit more of a reason to say I could do that. But then there's all these other kind of productivity and task mm -hmm. management things that I could also do. And this is this neat thing that, you know, isn't going to glare up in the hot sun. You know, it's easier on my eyes, especially late at night. There's a lot of things to like about it. 
Yeah, I wasn't too sure about the when you know the mentioning of the signing of document. Uh, sorry, not the signing, but the uh, note taking. Um, but even though the, you know I could see it as being somewhat useful, but the signing of documents is super interesting because I can't tell you how many times in the last year I've had a digital document that I had to out of print and then rescan in or um, you know just scribble my finger in a word document to try to get that thing signed. So being able to send it to the device and sign it and then send it back, that's pretty cool actually. Yeah, there's there's some there's some pretty seamless things I've already I, I I was I've already thought to myself, okay, well I already had a solution, but this is a better one. It just feels mm -hmm. better. So yeah. you know, taking notes, well, taking notes. Uh, make sure to become a patron uh, by August so you can get the full live with it when uh, Sarah's done testing the remarkable too. Well, I've got perhaps good news, perhaps bad news. You tell me. Uh, the blue screen of death, you might know it as the old BSOD, has been the crash screen displayed by Windows for decades now. Windows 11 will also feature a BSOD. However, hold on to your butts because the color is changing to black. The overall look remains consistent, though, and it's part of the redesign introduced in Windows 8. You know, it would have been a lot better move if the acronym wasn't exactly the same. <laughs> <laughs> it's still it's still frustrating also. <laughs> yes, yeah. so you're still going to be yeah. mad. You're still going to be looking at a bunch of numbers. You have no idea what it means. And you're still going to wonder, like, why did you even bother giving me a QR code? What does that even do? <laughs> and it's still going to be the BSOD. Yep, yep. All right, let's check. let's check out the mailbag. Uh, we got uh, an email from somebody who works at Wing, uh, who chose to remain anonymous, uh, who says, I'm not, and, and this is in response to our story from, was it yesterday or two days ago, uh, about Wing and, and drones and, and the idea that we can, um, as, as consumer drone flyers, get approval to fly in areas that uh, we might need approval for. Uh, Worker at Wing says, I'm not quite sure if gathering data about where people fly drones would help Wing or Alphabet or Google in their ad services unless they shared that data with other parts of the company, which they do not. I'm sure that's somewhere in their terms of service and privacy policy. But Anonymous says, one possible use case for making such an app as this, though, could be to prevent mid-air collisions between wing drones and consumer drones. The high barrier to getting flight authorization means that many people fly without getting one. When they do that, Wing has no way of knowing that their drone is in Wing's flight path, and Wing risks colliding with that drone. By using a system like Low Altitude Authorization and Notification Capability, or LAANC, Wing forwards the flight reservation to a UAS service provider, those are the people maintaining that data, and then checks with the UASSP when planning a delivery that ensures people get their deliveries and no one goes home with a broken drone. Ah. Oh. That's fascinating. Uh, thank you, anonymous person from Wing. Uh, I never thought advertising was what that data would be valuable for for Wing. I thought maybe optimization uh, or, or route planning or something like that. But this brings it into focus. It's like, oh yeah, and safety, uh, and, and it's a great example of that. Thank you, uh, anonymous Wing person, uh, for that the really clarification. Cool. That really yeah, cool. That's yeah. A lot of yeah. Uh, we love getting feedback from inside the walls themselves. Uh, you know, between it the wings. Doesn't happen every day. Yes, between the wings. It doesn't happen every day, but when it does, uh, we really appreciate it. But if you have thoughts, questions, comments on anything that we talk about on any of our shows, please do send them to us. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Shout out to our patrons at our master and grandmaster levels. We're shouting you all out, but today we're shouting out three in particular John and Becky Johnston, Chris Benito, and Steve Iadarola. Hey, guess what? We also have a brand new boss. Again? And his name is Steve Davis. Yeah, Tom. It's been five for five this week. Nice. Just, Steve just started backing us on Patreon. Thank you, Steve. Be like Steve. Steve, 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 Steve. Oh, Steve. Uh, oh, yeah. Steve. I mean, we told you if you become a patron, we you we make a big deal. And we thank you very much because you're now our boss and we welcome you into the family. And uh, if Five for five all week long. Love that. Thank you all. Thank you, everybody who is our patron. And also, thanks to Len Peralta, who has been busily illustrating today's show. What have you drawn for us, Len? Well, you know, I have a couple of uh, Alexis's in my life, and um, I found this story to be pretty interesting. I, I, what I found interesting is the the chant of Alexa is human, which I think mm. is pretty cool. Uh, so here is that image. It's uh, a, a young woman who I'm assuming has the wake word name. 
Uh, and it's sort of like a it's 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 sort of like a um, a poster for uh, um, uh, the wake words uniting. I don't want to keep getting people's you know uh, uh, devices uh, working here, uh, but you can take a look at it. It's about no bullying. Uh, the the young lady is actually crushing uh, a, a device with her foot, and uh, and is really trying to p- take that name back from Amazon. So if you'd like to see this image, you can go ahead. Um, if you're a Patreon of mine, uh, it's yours, patreon.com forward slash Len. Uh, you're, you can also get it at my online store at lenperaltastore.com. And uh, other than that, it's just just check it out. It's pretty cool art. It's fun. Yeah, good stuff. Good stuff. And we haven't set off my echo once during this entire conversation today. Oh, good. I'm glad. I was trying not to. I didn't Your want, mileage I didn't want to, may vary. Uh, no, this is really good. Anybody. This is really good, Len. I love it. Thank you. Good work, Len. Uh, also, great to have Chris Ashley on the show. Just listened to the latest SMR podcast on my jog this morning, Chris. But uh, what what else you got going on? Oh, you know, trying to figure out what to do for the barbecue weekend. You know, do I go <laughs> all out or do I continue with this hardcore diet? But uh, if you want to figure out or find out what I did, uh, come check me out on the SMR podcast. Me and the homies record every week. Um, you might find out how to barbecue something. You may have to find out how to do some woodworking, or you may find out some new perspective on some tech stories. Who knows? Uh, it's all good. It's all good. SMRpodcast.com. We are also live on this show Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern. That's 2030 UTC. And you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We will be off on Monday for the Independence Day holiday here in the U.S. Back on Tuesday with Owen J.J. Stone, a.k.a. Odacta. Talk to you then. This week's episodes of Daily Tech News Show were created by the following people. Host producer, writer, Tom Merritt. Host producer, writer, Sarah Lane. Executive producer and booker, Roger Chang. Producer, writer, and host, Rich Strafalino. Video producer, Twitch producer, Joe Kuntz. Associate producer, Anthony Lamos. Spanish language host, writer, producer, Dan Campos. News host, writer, and producer, Jen Cutter. Science correspondent, Dr. Nikki Ackermans. Social media producer and moderator, Zoe Detterding. Our mods, Beatmaster, W. Scottis One, BioCal, Captain Gipper, and Sh- Jack Shid, mod and video hosting by Dan Christensen, video feed by Sean Way, music and art provided by Martin Bell, Dan Luters, Mustafa A, Acast, Creative Ast Arts, and Len Peralta. Live art also performed by Len Peralta. Acast ad support from Trace Gaynor, Patreon support from Stefan Brown. Contributors on this week's show were Patrick Norton, Scott Johnson, Justin Robert Young, and Chris Ashley. And our guest this week was Nate Langson. Thanks to all the patrons who make the show possible. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Simon Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>